Lesson 1 for December 26 to January 1, ready for teaching on January 2, Crisis of Identity. But before we start, I have the thrill of introducing Dr. Roy E. Gain, who's a Hebrew scholar and a teacher of Old Testament at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. Dr. Gain has written this series of 13 lessons on the book of Isaiah. Dr. Gain, thank you for reading the introduction. From the time they were first uttered, the words of the prophet Isaiah have been etched, even embedded into our consciousness. There are unforgettable words, heavy laden not only with meaning, but also with hope and with promise. Words like, God is with us, for unto us a child is born. Every valley shall be exalted, and he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Words create pictures, images, echoes. Weak, paltry words create weak, paltry pictures. Powerful, refined, well-crafted words create powerful, refined images and loud, crisp echoes. This, of course, explains why Isaiah's words speak so loudly, so crisply to us, even after 27 centuries. In his Suffering Servant poem, for instance, Isaiah brings a picture of the Messiah into finer resolution than anywhere else in the Old Testament. This section alone is enough to justify the name the Gospel Prophet. Plus, his prediction of Cyrus by name a century and a half before the Persian king conquered Babylon, is so stunningly specific that some scholars have attributed much of Isaiah to a later second Isaiah, a hollow creation of those unable to see past the crusty intellectual confines of human imagination. With a unique blend of vivid imagery, matchless poetic rhythm and balance, Beethoven-like dramatic contrasts, and a rich weave of profound themes that recur in a sophisticated symphonic process of ongoing elaboration and development. Isaiah's inspired book is a worthy literary vehicle for divine thoughts that are higher than the mundane as the heavens are higher than the earth. Even in translation, which loses the evocative word plays and alliterations of the Hebrew, the book of Isaiah has few peers in the history of literature, whether secular or sacred. We know his words, so eloquent, so poetic, so emotive and powerful, but do we know the man, Isaiah, and the world in which he wrote, prayed, and prophesied? As the cruel Assyrian Empire rose to its height of power, it was a time of crushing peril. Even worse, the people of Judah, the chosen people, were sinking ever deeper into moral weakness. Greed and misery fought in the streets. In their struggle for wealth or survival, some puffed the narcotic vapors of vain euphoria, while others withered in despair. Seeking to preserve his nation's identity by taking a remnant from a state of denial and anchoring them to reality, Isaiah called upon his people to behold their God, the Holy One of Israel, the Creator of heaven and earth, the One who knew them by name and who promised to redeem them from fire, but only if they would listen and obey. Isaiah counseled kings. When the slender thread of God's remnant line was confined to one city, doomed by Assyrian legions, it was Isaiah's prophetic words that strengthened King Hezekiah to look for the miracle that was Jerusalem's only hope. If Jerusalem had fallen then, rather than to the Babylonians a century later, the Assyrian policy of scattering conquered peoples could have vaporized the national identity of Judah. Thus, there would have been no Jewish people from whom the Messiah the Savior of the world, would arise. This quarter, we take a look at Isaiah, at his words, his times, his predicaments, but mostly at his God. The God who back then, as well as today, cries out to us, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Sabbath afternoon, December 26. Before we start, let's pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, we come to open your word again at the beginning of another quarter. We're dealing with the amazing book of Isaiah, the place where we see your hand, the place where we see your greatness, and the place where we see your compassion and grace, as predicted in the life of Jesus Christ. As we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us, bless us, and help us to be the light of the world ourselves in the area where we live. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Let's read that again, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they were red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Lost in the land of forgetfulness. If you drive in Ireland along a narrow country lane lined with hedgerows, you may find the way blocked by a herd of cows ambling home from a crunchy meal. Even if no herdsman is among them, they will go to their owner's barn. They will know where and to whom they belong. If a small boy in a store gets separated from his mother and yells, I've lost my mummy, he may not know exactly where he is or where his mother is, but amid a sea of mothers walking through the store, he will know the one mother who alone is his own. Sad to say, unlike even those Irish cows, much less the little lost boy, the Judeans forgot that they belonged to the Lord, their heavenly Lord, and thus lost their true identity as the covenant people. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Isaiah 1, verses 2 and 3. This week, we will take a look at God's work to restore his people to himself. Sunday, December 27. Hear, O heavens! The book of Isaiah briefly introduces itself by identifying the author, son of Amos, the source of his message, a vision, and his topic, Judah and its capital Jerusalem during the reign of four kings. The topic also identifies Isaiah's primary audience as the people of his own country during the time in which he lived. The prophet spoke of them concerning their own condition and destiny. By mentioning the kings during whose reigns he was active, Isaiah narrows down the audience and ties the book to the historical political events of a certain time. This time frame directs us to the accounts of 2 Kings chapters 15 to 20 and 2 Chronicles chapters 26 to 32. Question. Read Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 2. What is the essence of the message here? What is the Lord saying? How has this same idea been seen all through sacred history? Could it be said of the Christian church today as well? Explain your answer. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Notice how Isaiah's message begins with the words, Hear, O heavens, and listen, O earth. Uh, let's compare that with Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both you and your descendants may live. And Deuteronomy 31 and verse 28. 
Gather to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their hearing, and call heaven and earth to witness against them. The Lord isn't implying that heaven and earth themselves can hear and understand. Instead, he does it for emphasis. When an ancient Near East king, such as a Hittite emperor, made a political treaty with a lesser ruler, he invoked his gods as witnesses to emphasize that any violation of the agreement would surely be noticed and punished. However, when the divine king of kings made a covenant with the Israelites in the day of Moses, he did not refer to other gods as witnesses. As the only true God, he called instead for the heavens and the earth to fulfil his role, as we read in Deuteronomy 4, verse 26. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day, that you will soon utterly perish from the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your days in it, but will be utterly destroyed. So to finish today... Read carefully Isaiah 1, verses 1 through 9. Summarise on the lines below what the sins of Judah were. Take special note also of the results of those sins. What was Judea guilty of, and what happened because of her guilt? At the same time, what hope is presented in verse 9? Isaiah 1, beginning at verse 1. The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know my people. Do not consider. Alas, Sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel, they have turned away backward. Why should ye be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints, from the sole of the foot even to the head. There is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. Your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. Monday, December 28. Forgotten Ritualism. Question. Read Isaiah chapter 1 verse 10. Why do you think he was using the imagery of Sodom and Gomorrah? What point was the Lord making? Isaiah 1 verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. And another question, read Isaiah 1, verses 11 to 15. What is the Lord telling the people there? Why did the Lord reject the worship that his people were offering him? Isaiah 1, beginning at verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls, or of lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. 
I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. The same hands that offered sacrifices and were lifted up in prayer were full of blood, that is, guilty of violence and oppression of others, as we read in verse 15. And Isaiah 58, verses 3 and 4, reads, Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls, and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast you find pleasure, and exploit all your labourers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate, and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day, to make your voice heard on high. By mistreating other members of the covenant community, they were showing contempt for the protector of all Israelites. Sins against other people were sins against the Lord. Of course, God himself had instituted the ritual worship system in Leviticus chapter 1 through to chapter 16, and designated the Jerusalem temple as the appropriate place for it, as we read in 1 Kings 8, 10 and 11. And it came to pass, when the priests came out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. But the rituals were intended to function within the context of the covenant God had made with his people. It was God's covenant with Israel that made it possible for him to dwell among them at the sanctuary or temple. So, rituals and prayers performed there were valid only if they expressed faithfulness to him and his covenant. People who offered sacrifices without repenting from unjust actions toward other members of the covenant community were performing ritual lies. Thus, their sacrifices were not only invalid, but they also were sins. Their ritual action said that they were loyal, but their behaviour proved they had broken the covenant. And so to finish today. Read Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. What is the Lord commanding that his people do? Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. How do these verses in this context parallel what Jesus said in Matthew 23, 23 to 28? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautifully outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones, and are all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. What message can we find for ourselves today in these texts and in the context in which they are given? Tuesday, December 29. The Argument of Forgiveness. Question. Read Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. 
After going over it numerous times, write what you believe the Lord is saying here. Read a few verses beyond it to get the whole context. Isaiah 1 verse 18 Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God has provided powerful evidence that the Judeans, the accused, are guilty of breach of contract. We read about that in Isaiah 1 verses 2 to 15 yesterday. And he has appealed to them to reform, as we read in Isaiah 1 verses 16 to 17. This appeal suggests there is hope. After all, why urge a criminal deserving execution to change his ways? How could a prisoner on death row rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow, as we read? But when God says, come now, let us argue it out, as it says in verse 18 in the New Revised Standard Version, we can see the Lord still seeking to reason with his people, still seeking to get them to repent and turn from their evil ways, no matter how degenerate they have become. The Lord says to them that your sins shall become white. Why are sins red? Because red is the colour of the blood, blood guilt, that covers the hands of the people, as we read in Isaiah 1 verse 15. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. White, by contrast, is the colour of purity, the absence of blood guilt. Here, God is offering to change them. This is the kind of language King David used when he cried out to God for forgiveness for his sin of taking Bathsheba and destroying her husband. As we read in Psalm 51, verse 7, "'Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean,' Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And in verse 14, Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. In Isaiah 1 verse 18, God's argument is an offer to forgive his people. Question, how does God's offer of forgiveness serve as an argument for them to change their ways? And we're going to compare Isaiah one eighteen with Isaiah 44, verse 22. So let's read chapter 1, verse 18 again. Come now, and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 22 we read, I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions, and like a cloud your sins return to me, for I have redeemed you. Now we see the purpose of God's sharp words of warning against his people. They are not to reject his people, but to bring them back to him. His offer of forgiveness is the mighty argument supporting his appeal for the people to purify themselves morally, as we read in verses 16 and 17. Well, let's read those again. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. His forgiveness makes it possible for them to be transformed by his power. Here we see the seeds of the new covenant prophesied in Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34, in which forgiveness is the basis of a new heart relationship with God. Let's read those verses in Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning at verse 31. 
Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall each man teach his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. We start off in the red, owing a debt we can never repay. From the humble position of acknowledging our need for forgiveness, we are ready to accept everything God has to give. Wednesday, December 30. To eat or be eaten. Question. Read Isaiah chapter 1, verses 19 to 31. What theme appears here that is seen all through the Bible? Isaiah 1, beginning at verse 19. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. How the faithful city has become a harlot. It was full of justice, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your wine mixed with water, your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. Therefore the Lord says, The Lord of hosts, the Mighty One of Israel, Ah, I will rid myself of my adversaries, and take vengeance on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you, and thoroughly purge away your dross, and take away all your alloy. I will restore your judges as at the first, and your counsellors as at the beginning. Afterward you shall be called the City of Righteousness, the Faithful City. Zion shall be redeemed with justice, and her penitence with righteousness. The destruction of transgressors and of sinners shall be together, and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed, for they shall be ashamed of the terebinth trees, which you have desired, and you shall be embarrassed because of the gardens, which you have chosen." For you shall be as a terebinth whose leaf fades, and as a garden that has no water. The strong shall be as tender, and the work of it as a spark. Both will burn together, and no one shall quench them. Notice the logical structure in Isaiah one nineteen and 20. If the people choose to be willing and obedient to God, they will eat the good of the land. That's verse 19. By contrast, if they refuse his word of forgiveness and restoration and rebel against him, they will be eaten by the sword, as it said in verse 21. The choice is theirs. These verses, then, contain a conditional blessing and curse. Isaiah 1 reiterates and applies the words of Moses recorded in Deuteronomy 30 verses 19 and 20, at the time when the covenant with the nation of Israel was set up. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Question. Look at those words from Moses. Notice there is no middle ground. It is either life or death, blessings or curses. Why do you think there is only one of two choices for us? Why can't there be some kind of compromise? I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. 
Therefore choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey His voice, and that you may cling to Him, for He is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. These words of Moses summarize the series of warnings, blessings, and curses that conclude the formation of the covenant in Deuteronomy chapter 27 through to Deuteronomy chapter 30. And we're asked to compare that with Leviticus 26. Let's read that now, but before I do, elements of this covenant include 1. The recounting of what God had done for them. 2. Conditions or stipulations or commandments to be observed in order for the covenant to be maintained. 3. References to witnesses. and 4. Blessings and curses to warn people what would happen if they violated the covenant conditions. Scholars have found that these elements appear in the same order in political treaties involving non-Israelite peoples, such as the Hittites. So, for establishing God's covenant with the Israelites, he used a form they would understand and would impress upon them as forcefully as possible the nature and consequences of the mutually binding relationship into which they were choosing to enter. The political benefits of the covenant were staggering. But if Israel broke their agreement, they would be worse off than ever. Leviticus chapter 26, beginning at verse 1. You shall not make idols for yourselves. Neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar shall you rear up for yourselves. Nor shall you set up an engraved stone in your land to bow down to it. For I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last till the time of vintage and the vintage shall last till the time of sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none will make you afraid. I will rid the land of evil beasts, and the sword will not go through your land. You will chase your enemies, and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you. For I will look on you favourably and make you fruitful, multiply you and confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat the old harvest and clear out the old because of the new. I will set my tabernacle among you and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their slaves. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you walk upright. But if you do not obey me, I do not observe all these commandments. And if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgments so that you do not perform all my commandments, but break my covenant, I also will do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you, wasting disease and fever which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you, and you shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when no one pursues you. And after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze, and your strength shall be spent in vain. For your land shall not yield its produce, nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruit. Then, if you walk contrary to me, and are not willing to obey me, I will bring on you seven times more plagues, according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, destroy your livestock, and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. And if by these things you are not reformed by me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you, and I will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword against you, 
that will execute the vengeance of the covenant. When you are gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. When I have cut off your supply of bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall bring back your bread by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. And after all this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters." I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and cast your carcasses on the lifeless forms of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. I will lay your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries to desolation, and I will not smell the fragrance of your sweet aromas. I will bring the land to desolation, and your enemies who dwell in it shall be astonished at it. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths, as long as it lies desolate, and you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths, as long as it lies desolate, it shall rest. For the time it did not rest on your Sabbaths, when you dwelt in it. And as for those of you who are left, I will send faintness into their hearts in the lands of their enemies. The sound of a shaken leaf shall cause them to flee. They shall flee as though fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when no one pursues. They shall stumble over one another as it were before a sword, when no one pursues. And you shall have no power to stand before your enemies." You shall perish among the nations, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And those of you who are left shall waste away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands, also in their fathers' iniquities, which are with them, they shall waste away. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness, in which they were unfaithful to me, and that they also have walked contrary to me, and that... I also have walked contrary to them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, and they accept their guilt, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham, I will remember. I will remember the land. The land also shall be left empty by them, and will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. They will accept their guilt, because... They despised my judgments, and because their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet, for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor shall I abhor them, to utterly destroy them, and break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. But, for their sake, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, and I will be their God." I am the Lord. These are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between himself and the children of Israel on Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. And so to finish today, in your own Christian walk, how have you experienced the principle of blessings and curses as seen above? Thursday, December 31. Ominous Love Song. Question. Read this song in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. What is the meaning of this parable? Isaiah 5, beginning at verse 1. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. 
And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard, what more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. God explains the meaning of the parable only at the end in Isaiah 5 verse 7, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. By using a parable, he helps the people to look at themselves objectively in order to admit their true condition. God effectively used this approach with King David in 2 Samuel chapter 12 verses 1 to 13. Let's read that. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveller came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes, and give them to your neighbour, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the son. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. By calling this a love song in the New Revised Standard Version, God reveals at the outset his motive toward his people. His relationships with them originates with his character, which is love, as we read in 1 John 4, 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. He expects a response of love in return, but instead of grapes he gets wild grapes, which means, in the Hebrew, stinking things. Question. What does the Lord mean when he says in Isaiah 5, 4, What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? God says in the next verses, 
in verses 5 and 6 of Isaiah chapter 5, And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. When we sin, God does not immediately cut us off from himself by removing his protection and destroying us. He patiently gives us an opportunity to receive forgiveness, as we read in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He does not cut off anyone who responds to him. He appeals as long as there is hope for a response. He does not immediately take no for an answer, because he knows we are ignorant and deceived by sin. But if he gets nowhere with us, he ultimately acknowledges our choice and lets us remain the way we have chosen to be, as we read in Revelation 22, verse 11. He who is unjust... Let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. If we persistently reject God's appeals through his Spirit, we can eventually pass to the point of no return, as we read in Matthew 12, verses 31 and 32. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Turning away from Christ is dangerous, as we read in Hebrews 6, 4-6, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to the, an open shame. There is only so much God can do because he respects our free choice. And so to finish the day, take the concept found in Isaiah 5.4 about what more could have been done to my vineyard and look at that in light of the cross where God offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins, paying with his flesh for our violation of his law. What more could have been done for us than what he did there? How does dwelling on the cross give us assurance of salvation and motivate us to repent and change our ways? Friday, January 1. From the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1137, we read, In the context of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 4, Ellen White wrote, The professed people of God had separated from God, and had lost their wisdom and perverted their understanding. They could not see afar off, for they had forgotten that they had been purged from their old sins. They moved restlessly and uncertainly under darkness, seeking to obliterate from their minds the memory of the freedom, assurance and happiness of their former estate. They plunged into all kinds of presumptuous, foolhardy madness, placed themselves in opposition to the providences of God, and deepened the guilt that was already upon them. They listened to the charges of Satan against the divine character and represented God as devoid of mercy and forgiveness. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. How can you wash yourselves? 
What does this phrase mean in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13? Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Question. How did Jesus adapt, expand and apply the love song of the vineyard? What lessons are in the above story for us as Seventh-day Adventists? Firstly, Matthew 21, verses 33 to 45. Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then, last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do with those vine dressers? They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, The kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. And Mark chapter 12, verses 1 to 12. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now at vintage time he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again he sent them another servant, and at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away, shamefully treated. And again he sent another, and him they killed, and many others beating some and killing some. Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, They will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. And in Luke chapter 20, verses 9 to 19, then he began to tell the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard, leased it to vine dressers, and went to do a far country for a long time. Now at the vintage time he sent a servant to the vine dressers, that they might give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the vine dressers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again he sent another servant, and they beat him also, treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty-handed. And again he sent a third, and they wounded him also, and cast him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Probably they will respect him when they see him. 
But when the vine dressers saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, Certainly not. Then he looked at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls it will grind him to powder. And the chief priests and the scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on him. But they feared the people, for they knew he had spoken this parable against them. And question three. What is the relationship between the forgiveness God offers and the transformation he accomplishes in our lives? Which comes first? Transformation and then forgiveness? Or forgiveness and then transformation? And why is it important to know which comes first? And four. In the quotation above, Ellen White says people place themselves in opposition to the providences of God. What does that mean? So, to summarise this week's lesson, when God's people forget Him and take His blessings for granted, He reminds them they are accountable to their covenant with Him. Mercifully, he points out their condition, warns them about the destructive consequences of abandoning his protection, and urges them to allow him to heal and cleanse them. Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Duped in Ukraine and once again it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. A Seventh-day Adventist deacon never expected to be duped by a mother and her teenage son whom he invited into his home after they fled conflict in eastern Ukraine. But he has no regrets. We acted with sincere hearts for God, and we will let God act as the judge between her and us, Valentin Zatsev said. The story began in 2015, when Valentin learned that a first wave of internally displaced people had reached his Black Sea city, Mykolaiv. The plight of the internally displaced people touched his heart, so Valentin, a construction foreman, set out with his wife to a government-run hostel where they found 50 displaced people living in two buildings, six to eight people per room. Valentin introduced himself as a Christian and asked the displaced people what they needed. The immediate reply was diapers and wet wipes. We went to the supermarket and bought both, Valentin said. We then asked what else we could provide and they asked for underwear, women's hygiene items, and potatoes. The authorities had given them a place to stay, but not much else. As a friendship grew, Valentin invited his new friends to Bible studies. Eleven agreed, and an Adventist pastor began to study with them every evening. Then violence erupted at the hostel, and a 19-year-old man, Valerie, was hospitalised with stab wounds. When Valentin and his wife visited the hospital, the teen's mother, Natasha, pleaded for a new place to stay. Valentin was renting a three-room apartment, and he offered a room to her and her son. For a while, everything seemed fine. Natasha even attended the Adventist church, but then Valentin found out that she was not penniless as she claimed, and that she was taking advantage of people's kindness to con them out of money. We fed her and her son and paid their cell phone bill, he said. But then we learned that they were not poor. We asked them to move out. Natasha and her son had lived with the family for six months. Looking back, Valentin said the experience was a blessing. Natasha proved a big help around the house, cooking, washing and babysitting his three children. But the biggest blessing, he said, 
was the opportunity to love her. We received joy and blessings because we were able to serve someone else, he said. Our family became better. I would not do anything differently. Valentin believes that it is important to help everyone whether or not they accept Jesus. Our duty is to live and serve, and the rest is up to God, he said. We water with goodness, and God collects the harvest. And there's a lovely photo of Valentin here on the left, smiling with his lovely teeth. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help construct an elementary school and high school in Buka in Ukraine. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.